truly an amazing song, wouldn't you say, man? Thank you, Carla. Beautiful music. Beautiful song. Bow our heads for a word. Lord, thank you for that beautiful song, The Way of Suffering, where Jesus brought the way of joy and gladness for us. Lord, may we embrace all that you've done on our behalf for your honor and glory. And the ultimate honor and glory would be to reflect your character to this world. So help us to be so subservient, so submissive to you, is to yield our life into your hands for the potter to make whatever would glorify him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to capital punishment, uh, <clears throat> the United States has abolished it in 23 of our 50 states. So 23 states, no capital punishment. New Hampshire does allow for hanging, uh, but there's only one person left on death row, and that's only for capital, for uh, oh, he's the only one eligible to be yet hung per, ch per chance. The first state to abolish death, the death decree was Michigan, <clears throat> way back in 1843, for all crimes except the crime of treason. In 1972, the federal death penalty was held unconstitutional following a Supreme Court opinion. So the federal courts, there will be no more death uh, put to death for any crimes committed. The arguments were that society's moral obligation is to protect life, not to take it. it the inhumaneness of it all, <coughs> excuse me, and the continuing racial and economic biases. Obviously, there's a large percentage of a few races that are put to death more than others, and it just doesn't seem right. And lastly, the irreversibility and mistakes have been made. Had been made. And this morning we look at the death of Jesus, uh, his crucifixion on the cross, and we got to agree to this pretty much that there was no more an inhumane way to die than the cross that Jesus died on. In the United States now, we would say, "Oh, that's illegal. You can't crucify the King of Glory." Um, so this is obviously written in another place, another time. We backtrack a little bit. Jesus had been in the Garden of Gethsemane. The weight of the sins of the world crushed upon him. He felt that painly, uh, he felt acutely the pain of separation from his father because sin separates us from God. Under great stress, Jesus sweat great drops of blood in the garden. His disciples slept while he sought their prayers, too tired to pray. Could you not watch with me but one hour? Ever been there? You ever wanted to watch with Jesus for one hour and you're just too tired to do that? So were his disciples. An angel was sent to strengthen Jesus, to assure him of his father's love, <clears throat> to assure him that what he would go through would result in the other discomfiture of Satan and the wicked angels and evil and all that sin has brought, that everything would be restored as it was before sin came into existence. And many would be saved as a result of what Jesus would go through. And Jesus went forward. Yes, he was betrayed by one disciple, denied by another. All of his disciples fled when he was arrested and taken. And uh, then he went through a series of seven trials, which we looked at last time. And I like the statement in the Desire of Ages, never was a criminal treated in so inhumane a manner as was the Son of God. You've seen a lot of injustice in the world, None of them compare to the injustice that Jesus experienced. So there were two times where Jesus had to have the Roman soldiers actually save him from the mob or they would have torn to pieces before he could have even gotten on the cross. So we picked up a story a Friday morning after sunrise. Already Jesus had been tried by the Sanhedrin. He's been convicted. He's gone to Pilate, here back to Pilate, and now Jesus is convicted to be crucified. Pilate, in frustration of not being able to release Jesus without incurring the wrath of the religious leaders, turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be flogged one more time before being sent to be crucified. Jesus was twice scored. Should we pick up in Mark chapter 15, verse 15 to 20, with this story of Jesus? And it says, uh, so Pilate Wanting to gratify the crowd, <clears throat> released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus after he had scourged Jesus to be crucified. And then the soldiers led him away to the hill called uh, to the praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they saluted him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck him on the head with a reed, and they spat on him. 
bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And then they had, after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off, put on his clothes, and led him out to crucify him. Somebody mentioned there were seven wounds in Jesus, two in the hands, two in the feet, one in the side, one in the back, right? One on the brow with the thorny crowns. Jesus was truly a man of suffering. So it was a little after 8 a.m. when this occurred, <clears throat> as Jesus prepares to walk down the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. And by now, the word had gotten out to the masses, and people were flocking, flocking to see Jesus. All ranks, all classes, many of them had been healed, many of their children had been healed. The disciples also came and uh, witnessed what was happening there. When they got to the gate of Pilate's court, that's where they put the cross on Jesus to see him bear it to the hill of Calvary. They couldn't. He couldn't do it anymore. He hadn't had any food or water since the previous night. He'd agonized in the garden, wrestled with satanic forces. He had suffered mental anguish, being betrayed, forsaken, and denied. He endured seven trials, abuse, mockery, and insult, and was twice scourged. Yet Jesus only spoke words uh, that he had to glorify God. And he bore himself with dignity and firmness. But after the second scourging, human frailty just gave way. Jesus could not carry the weight of the crossbeam for the cross. Seeing that he was unable to carry it, the soldiers were what to do, because no Jew is going to pick up this lest they be contaminated, and because they would be contaminated, they would not be able to celebrate the Passover. So all the Jewish people were out, but then they see somebody, <clears throat> a foreigner coming, and apparently he had a look of surprise and indignation at the inhumaneness of the treatment they were giving him. And they said, you carry his cross. I'm talking about Simon of Cyrene. Luke 23, verse 26 to 32 tells a story of how Simon came and he picked up the cross of Christ and he bore it for him to the hill of Mount Calvary. Zyre of Ages says that Simon was always glad that he did carry the cross of Christ. And he became a believer like his son Rufus, I forget the other one's names, but his two sons were followers of Jesus. And Simon became one too. And ever after that, he carried the cross of Christ every day by choice, not compulsion, as we're also called to take up Christ, Christ's cross daily and uh, follow him. So a great multitude followed him, and among the women, there were many women there. Again, they had their sick children they had brought. To, some of them had been healed as well. And they wondered at the hatred of the crowd towards Jesus, the angry words of the religious leaders. How could this be? They expressed their sympathy with Jesus through mourning. You know, it's interesting, despite all the suffering that Jesus was going through, Jesus was moved with compassion for them. He was moved with compassion that they were in agony because of what he was going through. And they were crying because of that. It's fascinating <clears throat> that this is the only person that Jesus responds to on his way to the Calvary, the women who were crying for him. Finally, they get, to, he says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Finally, they get to, to the hill of Calvary. And there in Luke 23, verse 32, says there were two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Mark tells us when this took place, Mark 15, 25, that was the third hour and they crucified him. So it's the third hour, which would be about nine o'clock because you're close to the equator and it's pretty much consistent. The Roman soldiers, while they were busy crucifying Jesus over the Temple Mount, they were also busy because it was the hour of prayer. It was the one of the two times where they sacrificed a lamb offering for the sins of the nation. Nine o'clock, like clockwork, they offered the lamb symbolic of the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world. Ironic is, is that while they're offering the Lamb for the sins of the nation, Jesus is being crucified on the cross in fulfillment of that type. Type and antitype kind of meet right here. Simultaneously, they're occurring. It would be the last time they would need to do a sin offering. 
it would be the last time the Mount Calvary, I mean, the uh, temple would even need to, to do a sin offering because the sin offering was now being made in the person of Christ. So it's fascinating to me. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> the day before, there was a sin offering made by a priest who was a sinner. And the prayer was uttered by a priest who was a sinner. But on Good Friday, the sacrifice on the Temple Mountain was made by a priest. But the prayer was offered by somebody who was sinless, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ offered a prayer. And uh, what was the prayer that Jesus offered? What was the prayer that Jesus offered? The Lamb was all about grace and mercy for repentant sinners or sinful people who, in their ignorance, they, God winks at it, and they have a chance later to repent. Was there anybody who had freshly committed a crime that needed to be forgiven? Well, you look at Luke chapter 23, verse 34. <clears throat> then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, those who were crucifying him, for they don't know what they are doing. The hour of prayer, the hour of sacrifice, right on schedule, Jesus is crucified. The first thing out of his mouth is a prayer of forgiveness and for mercy. Totally consistent with who God is from the type to the antitype, the same thing. Grace and mercy just pours forth from God to even those who would murder. It's one thing to murder another sinner who's committed crimes against humanity or against God. It's another thing to murder an innocent person who's never sinned in their life or done anything wrong against God or humanity. More, more than that, to crucify your creator, the one who sustains your life, the one who loves you and has given himself for you, to murder him is a crime above all crimes, in my opinion. And Jesus takes the highest crime and says, Lord, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, if God can forgive the greatest crime ever, uh, there's nobody who God can't forgive. And Jesus demonstrated right out the gate, as soon as he's crucified, he is forgiving people right away, extending grace and mercy. What a great picture of a wonderful God that, that we worship. You know, I think about how the angels responded when Jesus was first baptized, right? He was inaugurating his mission. And then, um, you know, he knelt and he prayed. And the desire of ages made this interesting statement. Jesus pleaded with the Father for power to overcome humanity's unbelief. Boy, that's a pretty tough sell, isn't it? Humanity has tons of unbelief. And Jesus pled for the Father for power to overcome that unbelief. He pled for power to break the fetters which Satan had enthralled them. You ever get enthralled by things that are from Satan and not from God, whether it's social media or you know, what's in the movies or whatever. Have you ever gotten enthralled by that and been tempted and, and lured into it and actually gone through with something like that and been led into sin by it? Jesus pled for power to break the fetters that bind us. Jesus pled in humanity's behalf to conquer the destroyer. Lord, help me to conquer Satan so we can save humanity. And Jesus asked for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his son. <clears throat> Lord, give me a witness, you know. Gideon, he wanted, to, he wanted to some evidence that God was with him. Lord, if, it, if you're really with me, help the fleece to be wet this time and around to be dry. Oh, okay, that worked. How about the other way? Lord, make the fleece dry and it wet around. Okay, that works too. So Jesus asked for a witness. <clears throat> and uh, the interesting statement that is made in spirit prophecy, never before have the angels listened to such a prayer. They are eager to bear their loved commander a message of assurance and comfort. But no, the Father himself will answer the petition of his Son. Direct from the throne issues the beams of his glory. The heavens are opened, and upon the Savior's head descends the dove-like form of the, representing the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Here Jesus utters another prayer. And we'll discover that not at 9 o'clock, but at about the midday, when there's darkness around Jesus, that darkness was to hide Jesus from all the wagging tongues and all the blasphemy mouths that were ridiculing Jesus. But the darkness of the clouds was the cloak that the Father was present and the angels were close around the cross of Jesus. Jesus, once again, the Father was there. When Jesus was baptized, my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased, 
Jesus utters prayer, Father, forgive them, they know what they do. Jesus, Father, is present there, watching everything on and uh, taking it in. And Jesus, God the Father, would respond to a prayer like that. And the angels, if they were wowed at the prayer at the baptism, they had to be really wowed at the prayer of Jesus while he's being crucified, asking for the forgiveness of his murderers, the murderers of God. Wow, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? To me, it just blows my mind. <clears throat> not only after the soldiers got Jesus on the cross, not long after that, they got him on the cross. We find out in John 19, verse 23, that uh, they took his garments, <clears throat> they made four parts of one part of it, and then they also took the tunic, and they gambled for it. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that the divided in four parts was at least four soldiers present at that time. And we will go on to discover later that one of those soldiers comes into the limelight. And we'll, we'll pick that story up in a second. So the gospel um, continues on talking about what happens. We looked at the second to third hour of his crucifixion. There was the passerbyers who... When they passed by, they wagged their heads and said, You who destroy the temple will build it in three days. Save yourself if you are the Son of God and come down. The chief priests and the scribes and the thieves, they said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. <clears throat> Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see him and believe. The soldiers also mocked him, saying, If you are the King, save yourself. But somewhere along the line, before noonday, there was a repentant thief that uh, made a cry out to Christ. While he was hanging on the cross, he chastised his fellow thief, and he said words like this. One of them blasphemed God, if you're the Christ, save us and, and yourself. <clears throat> the other said, do you not fear God, seeing that we're under the same condemnation? We've indeed, we've are getting what we justly deserve, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. <clears throat> then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, <clears throat> most assuredly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, the repentant thief was the second person on Good Friday that was saved because of their encounter with Christ. The first was Simon of Cyrene, and he would go on and have faith in Christ, and he would be saved as a result of his encounter with Christ on the Via Dolorosa. Here at the cross of Christ, it is this repentant thief who calls out in faith. And so we see that uh, Jesus gives him the assuring words, <laughs> you will be with me in paradise. What a wonderful answer to prayer that he prayed. So Jesus also did something interesting. He honored his mother, fulfilling the fifth commandment. John, your mother, mom, your son. John, take care of her, please. I'm dying. I'm going to go to heaven eventually, whatever. <clears throat> Jesus fulfilled, even on the cross, Jesus was fulfilling the fifth commandment. It's amazing to me. Then events of the fourth to the sixth hour, um, there was darkness came. This is where God stepped in. It's time to stop the wagging mouths. It's time to stop all the blasphemous talk against his son. And they just cloaked Jesus in darkness. And all of a sudden, they became to be silent around the cross of Christ. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus feeling the separation from his father, his life ebbing away. But he hung in the cross to carry our sin and paid our penalty for us. John 19, verse 28 to 30. <clears throat> Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So I was reading an interesting statements. Jesus knew he had fulfilled all of the requirements that were necessary for your and our salvation. That statement there, knowing that all things were now accomplished, Jesus knew that he had accomplished it all right there. So he goes on to say, I thirst that humanity of Jesus was thirsting. They go and get a, some sour wine and give it to him and whatnot. 
But right after that, Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. <clears throat> and it wasn't like, it is finished. It was a triumphant victory shout. It is finished. This great controversy with Satan is finished. I am the victor. We have conquered. Father and I, we have conquered over Satan and all the demonic forces of hell. It is finished. The great controversy is forever sealed. The end result is guaranteed based on the sacrifice of Jesus. Luke 23, verse 46 goes on to talk about when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. The sin sacrifice was now complete. Jesus was victorious. Other events that happened right at that time, <clears throat> it was the second sin sacrifice that was taking place that, at that moment. Right? It's the second sin sacrifice. Uh, and at that moment, as the apparently as the arm was upstretched to slay the lamb, that veil got rent from top to bottom like by the hand of God. And the holy place was thrown open to view for everybody. And in a way, God was saying, it's finished. This earthly tabernacle is no longer necessary. It is done. We have got ourselves a great high priest who was perfected through suffering. He has died. He's paid the penalty. And now he's going to be our great high priest. And he's not going to officiate not down here on an earthly tabernacle. He's going to <clears throat> officiate in the heavenly sanctuary at the right hand of the Father on behalf of you and I. At that very moment when Jesus died was the very moment that sin sacrifice took place in the temple and it was done. No more need for the earthly sanctuary anymore. There was a tremendous earthquake. Tombs were broken open at that time. And out of those tombs on Sunday morning would come some, the saints would come forth, go into the city, resurrected, and they would appear to many and testify about Jesus. Mark, Matthew chapter 27, 52, and so forth tells us about that. But there's something else that takes place right after Jesus dies, after all the earthquake and all that. And it's the third conversion story that happened that day. It's the Roman centurion, the pagan Roman centurion. What would he know about God? Well, something about Jesus impressed him because earlier, even he was mocking Jesus with the other soldiers. And just like the other thieves, both thieves were mocking Jesus but one repented, and so now one of the four Roman soldiers, the Roman centurion, who was right across from Christ, watched him die and said, surely he must have been the Son of God. He must be the Son of God. It was a statement of faith, and I expect to see that Roman centurion in heaven one day, and I'm looking forward to that. Truly this man was the Son of God. <clears throat> so that was um, the last event we're going to take time to look at today. Um, well, there's one more. The Luke 23, 48. The whole crowd who came together to that site, <clears throat> seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. Wait, this is the crowd that said, crucify him, crucify him. They had heard the accusations of the priest that he's a blasphemer, that he is one who has, you know, done things against Rome. And they believed the priests and they were like, crucify him. They were all against Jesus on the outside of it, but now from the midday, when they're, they were clothed in darkness, they are silent. And then when the darkness pulled apart, when Jesus finished the last part, it is finished, Father, hence I commit my spirit. When they saw that and they realized, you know what? The priests were wrong. The priests were wrong. They're convicting their heart and they go home quietly now. Nobody's saying, you know, nobody's cheering that Jesus has died. You know, God had, Jesus had, had prayed that prayer, right? Remember when he prayed at the inauguration that God would help break the hearts of unbelief, the hardness of man's heart? And God's, Jesus' prayer was being answered right then. Fifty days later, <clears throat> Peter would preach, you murdered your Messiah. You murdered him. What should we do? Men and brethren, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and receive the repentance of sins. You know, they responded. They responded. Jesus' prayer, the hardness of men's hearts, would be reversed, was answered after he died. The Roman centurion, after he died, surely he's a man of God faith. Sometimes it takes that. It takes it 
for you to go all the way through a painful event and hold true all the way to the very end and only at the very end when you're faithful all the way to death, somebody goes, you know what? There's something about that. Now they're convicted and now they respond. Not everybody responds while you're alive. Some after it happens. So we are going to close here with this text. At Calvary, I can't help but think of Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? Is God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or the sword? Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Waves of mercy broke over Jerusalem. The high priests and the other priests, many of them, hardened their hearts against it. But I want to suggest to you that waves of mercy are breaking over the bow of your heart today. And God is calling you that he loves you, that he's willing to forgive anything that you're willing to confess and to give you the assurance of salvation. Friend, will you harden your heart or will you open your heart today and say, Lord, I want you to be not only the king of glory, but I want you to be the king of my heart and of my life. And I submit it into your hand. I give you the territory of my heart to rule over in perpetuity. Friend, that's my desire for you. And Mom, we're going to have our closing song now at this time. Our closing song is, All That Thrills My Soul Is Jesus. Number 189.